me in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter number two. This is a very appropriate passage of scriptures, one of uh, my favorite passages of scriptures, particularly as it relates to the ministry of our church and my hope and aspiration for us to be a congregation that is particularly responsive to the realities of the context in which we live and work and minister. Ephesians is a uh, collection of what many believe to be Paul's greatest hits. It is Paul's uh, greatest themes. The Apostle Paul, who was one of the most prolific uh, church planting early followers of Jesus in the uh, first kind of 20 years or so after uh, the ascension and the death and the resurrection of Jesus, Paul went uh, broadly beyond Jerusalem and went into various parts of Europe and various parts of the Middle East region and began to help uh, educate and introduce and, and, and expose and make known the work that Jesus had done on the cross and how that was and continues to be a salvific roadway and roadmap for those who follow the ways of Jesus. And so this is a very particularly a powerful collection of Paul's thoughts and thinking, and my hope is uh, it will continue to offer to you and I uh, an amazing framework for how we uh, make disciples and how we ourselves become more faithful disciples, how we ensure that we uh, shed some of the sensibilities that are often uh, laid upon our faith in ways that ought not remain. How many of you can acknowledge that you may not be particularly responsible for how you were introduced the faith at a young age? Because for many of us who were taken to church, how many were taken to church? Like you didn't have a choice. You, you just like, you going to church and you was in there like, but I don't want it. And then after the I don't, you were ducking and kind of like, <laughs> no, I do, I do, I do, I love it. Church is amazing. I woke up this morning with my mind, stayed on Jesus. You just had a quick attitude change. Somebody say amen. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, uh, we didn't have an opportunity to always choose what kind of church we were going to be a part of. I remember, although we grew up here in a holiness Pentecostal context, uh, I didn't get to choose what kind of uh, school. My parents put us in a Christian school, and the Christian school was a Southern Baptist Christian school. So other than just being flat out racist, somebody say amen, uh, they didn't believe in clapping. So imagine the, the, the dissonance in my head. <laughs> Coming from a tongue talking, jumping, holly, you know, we're kind of mellow here at the way, you know, y'all rarely clap, praise God, you know, y'all. Y'all give me an amen here or there, but you know, there was a time. Mm -hmm. And if y'all want to clap more, you know, that's fine too. Ain't nobody, ain't nobody ask you to, you know, sit there and be silent. Praise God. We could bring it, we could bring it all the way back. I don't want to, you know, freak anybody out, but you know, but 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 imagine uh, our dissonance being in a tongue talking, chandelier swinging, rolling on the floor, hollering, jumping, shouting. And then you got to go to chapel every day, and they won't even let you rock. <laughs> won't let you clap. Matter of fact, if you did it, you would get in trouble. They disciplined you. Stop rocking. Don't clap. And you're just sitting there talking about, I get joy, 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 joy down in my heart. Where down in my heart. Where down in my heart. I got joy. <laughs> what a flashback I just had. You don't always get to choose what kind of introduction you get to the faith. But how many of you know that you do get to decide throughout the course of your life what kind of person, what kind of Christ follower you will be? And I do believe that Jesus can meet you wherever you engage 
this very broad and deep tradition called the way, the, fa the way of Jesus, historically assigned and described as Christianity. Jesus can meet you anywhere. Jesus can meet you in the midst of your atheistic agnostic space. You don't even need to have an introduction by a human being. Jesus can just drop a nugget in your head and you be sitting there like, what, the, what, wait, what? And Jesus can meet you in some of the most difficult spaces and places. So part of what I hope we appreciate is our job as followers of Jesus is to create spaces where folks get the greatest introduction of God while they are being exposed to some very unfaithful representations of God. My hope is that whenever there is a follower of the way at a school, on the block, in the neighborhood, at a game, at a family reunion, when people find out that you're a follower of Jesus, they won't clutch their pearls and swing back. But your presentation, your expression, dare I say your good work, will actually be a compelling expression. I don't plan to be before you long. I feel like I already preached half my, my time away. But let's read the scriptures. Ephesians chapter number two, Paul is attempting through uh, these phrases, these concepts, these ideas to help us understand the power that God gives us when we engage in the good work. Somebody say the good work that we're called to do. I think I'm reading from, I think this may be the message translation. You were dead through the trespasses and sins in which you lived, once lived, following the course of this world, following the ruler of the power of the air. How many know there's a course of this world? There's a way of thinking. There's a structure, framework of this world. Then there's the rulers of the powers of the air that, that, that the environment is often being influenced and impacted by forces and ideas that are not always in alignment with God's ways. Somebody say amen. The spirit that is now at work among those who are disobedient. <clears throat> Amen. I grew up, you know, everything was a spirit. You might have that kind of church. You got a lying spirit. You got a thieving spirit. You got a cussing spirit. You got a hating spirit. By the time you was done, it was like, man, I, I like what the pastor preached about last week. I'm legion. I just got a whole bunch of spirits. Mm -hmm. The spirit is now at work among those who are disobedient. Verse number three, all of us, everybody say all of us. All of us once lived among them in the passions of our flesh, following the desires of flesh and senses, and we were by nature children of wrath like everyone else. Verse four, but God. Everybody say, but God. But God. Come on, say it again, but God. But God. Somebody say, thank God, thank God. for the but God who is rich in mercy out of the great love with which God loved us, even when we were dead through our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the ages to come, God might show the immeasurable riches of God's grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Verse number eight, for by grace you have been saved through faith. For by grace you have been saved through faith. Everybody repeat that after me. By grace you have been saved through faith. Say it again. By grace you have been saved through faith. One more time, by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not your own doing. Amen. Hello, somebody. Hello. This is not your doing. It is the gift of God. Amen. I mean, I, I've, I've been preaching for about 10 minutes. Y'all don't even know it. Amen. It is not the results of your own works. 
So no one can boast. For we are what God has made us. Created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand to be our way of life. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Let us say thanks be to God. Pulling out an oldie but goodie title. If you've been here a while, you may have heard me preach this before, but there ain't no better way to say it. You are a piece of work. Amen. Come on, let's pray. God, we want to say thank you for the word of God. That has been read for us, the people of God. We ask you to hide this word in our hearts so we will not sin against you. And please send your anointing that makes preaching and teaching easy. May it rest on me and the hearers of your word. In Jesus' name, we pray Let the people of the way say amen. Amen. Come on, tell your neighbor, you are are a piece of work. Amen. Amen. (laughs) Go ahead. Look at the person next to you because I know some of you probably been wanting to say this. Ever since you met this person. So you you got another chance. Look at him and tell him you are a piece. Come on, tell him you are a piece of work. <laughs> if I was in another church, I'd tell you, get your finger and just wave it at him like no, just play. No, we don't want we 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 want peace in the house of God on a Sunday morning. But how many know one of the greatest challenges we will have as followers of Jesus living in today's context is to overcome the influence and formation of what I call to be a false and inferior gospel. A gospel that would seek to convince us that God's ways require violence in order for God's ways to win out and last in the world. How many of you know that God does not need your violence in order for God's power to be expressed in the world? I was reading a very disturbing New York Times article in the immediate aftermath of the assassination attempt of Donald Trump. And I even had some friends and people text me and, you know, just say things like, man, don't you wish he missed or he was more accurate? And then many of us, I thought I, at first, you know, still do find it very troubling to just understand how someone under the protection of the Secret Service could even be exposed to such lack of security. And then there's folks on the other side of the political spectrum who are now feeling that they are justified in preparing themselves for political violence. Now it's so important for us to not be too ahistorical because this country has a long history of political violence. I can name a whole lot of names. Martin Luther King Jr., how many know that was an act of political violence? John F. Kennedy and his brother Robert Kennedy, an act of political, Medgar Evers, an act of political violence. Abraham Lincoln, an act of political violence. Michael Brown, Sandra Bland, an act of political violence. And so we ought not to be too particularly surprised. People say, oh, this is not America. Oh, yes, it is. Violence in America is as American as apple pie. So we ought not need to tell ourselves a beautiful lie in order to be able to squarely declare that if you are a follower of Jesus, God does not need our violence in order for righteousness to take root in the world. All God needs is a repentant and willing heart. For it is indeed the case that there are ways of Christian practice in the West, in the United States in particular, that seems to have 
reappropriated and co-opted Jesus and wrapped Jesus in an American flag and made Jesus the mascot for imperial and state violence. This New York Times article was chronicling how this reporter went into a meeting in a barn. <laughs> like, Lord, you know if you're meeting in a barn about the state of politics and faith, it's gonna probably come out with some distorted kind of views. And yet, in this barn, they were talking about the importance of God, country, guns, and freedom. A toxic, toxic formula for a false gospel. And I want you and I to appreciate that we follow a Jesus, what I believe to be the historical Jesus, a dark-skinned Palestinian Jew born to an unwed teenage dark-skinned sister girl in the hood who was homeless, Jesus was, for most of his ministry and was unjustly arrested, racially profiled, by the police of his day. He was tried in a kangaroo court, was convicted of a crime he did not commit, and was unjustly executed by the government of his day. This Jesus, somebody say this Jesus. This Jesus is not the Jesus of the American church. This Jesus is a Jesus who asks us to lay down our life for our friends without violence. This Jesus is a Jesus that tells us that we must love our neighbors. This Jesus is a Jesus that tells us that we must literally sacrifice, be willing to sacrifice for the sake of those in need. This Jesus invites you and I to be a people who are willing to engage in the kind of work that God is working in and through us. Because be clear, beloved, God is at work in your life. This Jesus is at work in your life. And this Jesus knows how to take every part of your life and put it in the service of the work that God is doing in the world. The question for us is, if we are indeed a people being overly formed by a faith, a false or unfaithful gospel, then we may find ourselves being formed after the wrong Jesus. And that is why this passage is so powerful, because this passage speaks very clearly about the danger of being formed by the wrong influences. How many of you know that it is easy to put your mind on cruise control and not interrogate the things that are shaping your mind, shaping your heart, shaping your spirit? How many of you uh, appreciate that whenever you are in, uh, when you want to get in a certain mood, there are all kind of external things that you can do to get you in a mood. Uh, I was in uh, uh, Egypt at a at a uh, 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 oils shop. You know, whenever you travel to you know the the Middle East, everybody they got oils. You know, and they love to see American tourists come in and they tell you all the different oils that you can buy. You know, like an American tourist, I just bought a bunch of stuff. I mean, it just sitting in my house. I don't even use it, but it just felt so powerful. <laughs> and I remember, you know, they 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 sold me some some what they said was some frankincense, and they sold me some green stuff, and I can't even remember what it is. And if and they said, well, you know, burn this when you want a mood in your house that's tranquil. 
And I said, my God, I need tranquility in my house, praise God. So I bought a vial of that. And they said, you know, when, when, when you want to smell good and, 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 and attract, a turn on your partner, buy this. So I bought that. And, 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 and when, you, when, 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 you, when you when you want your body to relax, you rub this. And I bought that. And I, I left out of there with just a whole thing of stuff, amen, because I got convinced that there was external influences. Or some of y'all, that may be a little too exotic for you. How about, how about many of you know that when you, you trying to, you know, get, get in the mood, you put on certain kind of music. The music, woo, 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 woo. <laughs> It'll get you in a different mood. I talk to my young cats, and when they get ready to go do something dirty, they put on a certain kind of song that's throwing around the, dehumana the dehumanization of the person they getting ready to go jack up. Amen. Imagine going to try to hurt somebody with the soundtrack of Amazing Grace. How sweet the sound. That saved a wretch like me. Oh, I'm about to go get this person. How I many know it wouldn't work? I'm trying to talk to somebody up in here. Well, it is the same thing when you are Allowing a gospel to form you that makes you think that the immigrant, the queer person, the poor person, the person who uh, is from another country, who, who, who has a different level of melanin in their skin, you are being consistently told through the preaching and the teaching of the sermons on Sunday or the news you listen to all week long that these people are the problem. And so your mind is now being formed Amen. to think, well, I got to get rid of this person. Unless you get two hardy progressives. Amen. How many know the worst conditions in this Bay Area is not because of Donald Trump? Not because of the conservatives. How many know the progressives running everything out here? Amen. Unless you get two hardy good church people in the house today. How many of us have grown to believe that the worst problem in our community is a little black and brown boy or girl who, who's running around here often with empty stomachs and no arms to embrace them? And we mad because they knocking our window out. I know it's frustrating. Sometimes I don't have $100 to replace my window. So I'm not telling the bippers to bip away. I want them to stop. But the way to stop a bipper ain't by hiring another cop. The way you stop a bipper is to take the whole drive of bipping out of their system. I never forget, I think, uh, brother, 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 uh, 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 Anthony sent uh, or posted this thing about the bipping queen. And the bipping queen is uh, a couple of women uh, who don't even live in our community. I think they Southern California, and they got warehouses of stolen material. Uh -huh. Warehouses of Sephora, yeah. Yeah. and perfume, and electronics. How many you know the young person who's bipping can't do nothing with those stolen material unless they go give it to somebody else? Who then what, sells it? We're on Amazon.com. I wish I could talk to somebody in here. All these colluding forces. And yet we'll be more upset with Pookie and Ray Ray and, and, and not appreciate that some of this stuff is being driven by folks who are being led by the spirit of disobedience. We can get so misformed that we forget that we are called to literally reject the easy criminalization that is often laid upon our own children, families, and communities and start to hold accountable the systems and the structures that are waging war against the humanity and the bodies and the soul and the spirit. Because I love a book, I can't remember who said it, but the book says that your body keeps the score. And when trauma visits your body, it is not easily released. 
without a whole lot of work and healing. And how many know we got a lot of community members in our, in our city and in our region who have absorbed so much trauma. And the way you relieve trauma is not by creating more trauma, it's by introducing the traumatized to a healer. Oh, beloved, could you believe that God has called you and I and our congregation and all those who follow the ways of Jesus to be healers and not condemners, to be agents and forces of good in the world and not people who are constantly trying to enact and react to the worst conditions. The first thing that the scripture says that I believe you and I must do is check your influences. You and I can only be God's work, handiwork, God's extension of good work when we are conscious of the influences. You once lived under these influences. And I think the writer is being generous by saying you once lived. Because how many know some of us are still living under some of these influences? And some of these influences are anonymous to us but I believe that you and I have an opportunity to ask ourselves these questions these are the questions I want you to ask what forces are shaping your thoughts your speech your actions and your assumptions somebody holler what forces does the prince of the air have more influence than the spirit of Jesus the prince of the air and I want you to know there is a prince with a small p. There is a force, there is a power that is literally struggling against the spirit of Jesus, against that which is peaceful, that which is joyful, that which is restorative. There is a spirit that's out here trying to have an arm wrestling match with the eternal one. But I want you to know that that spirit can never match the power and the spirit of the living God. And that power and spirit of the living God is dynamic. It's moving. It's living inside of you. Pat yourself on the chest and say, it's living inside of me. The, the spirit is alive in you. But you got to be willing to unleash the spirit. Some of us think the spirit can only be unleashed while you're at church. Huh, glory. Spirit makes, makes, makes a tear run down your face. It do that. Makes you get a hook in the side. It do that. It make you shout and holler and dance. It do all of that. But how many know the spirit has more power than just uh, inside the building? Woo! Well, I wish I had somebody that believed that the spirit works everywhere. Spirit works on your job. The spirit works at your house. The spirit works in the community. But when the spirit works, listen, the spirit works without you having to commit violence. Some of us want the spirit to rubber stamp everything we think and do. And I'm here to tell you, the spirit is not your personal validator. Some things you do, the spirit ought to convict you. Oh, that's not right. That's not right. You shouldn't be cussing people out. That's not right. You shouldn't be slapping people upside the head. That's not right. You shouldn't be abusing your partner, your children. That's not right. You shouldn't be causing people to feel less than human. That's not right. You shouldn't be voting for certain causes and candidates. That's not right. You ought to be more uh, peaceful. Spirit ought to convict you. If the spirit is not convicting you, you're not in touch with the spirit. Hello, somebody. You ought to tell your neighbor the spirit ought to convict you about something. <laughs> it's running through here. The spirit don't ever convict you. Everything you do is right. The devil is a lie. You ain't right all the time. I wish I could tell the truth to somebody. Anybody ever met somebody feel like they just right all the time? Like they, they can never do nothing wrong. Oh, the spirit told me to say this. Spirit, no, the spirit didn't tell you to do that. How you know? Because the, the, the result is confusion. The result is not healing, Lord. I'm preaching too long. You got to be honest with yourself Amen. and say, sometimes my influences 
are not the spirit. And three ways, I'm going to give you three quick ways how you know it's not the spirit. There's, there's a lot of ways you can know. I'm going to give you three. One, if only you agree with it. It's not the spirit. It's not. I'm telling you now. Number two, if there is consistent, repetitive, biblical, and tradition witness against what you're talking about, it's not the spirit. And if you are part of a Christian community, and the Christian community is continuously trying to pull you towards more peace and love, and, and you going the other way, that's not the spirit either. The fruit of the spirit. And there's like nine of them. Love, joy, peace, goodness, meekness, temperance, gentleness, self-control. Long, Lord, somebody talk about long suffering. You want to know, you know what long suffering means? It means that you got a long runway before you go off on somebody. <laughs> How many know, Lord, I need your spirit? I need your spirit because some of these folk, amen, I don't got no runway. It's, 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 it's on site, praise God. How many of you got some on site folk in your life? It's like, it's, uh, it's on site. And that's why the spirit will help you to what? Avoid them. That'd be my prayer. God, please don't put me in a room with this person today. Because <laughs> I have no suffering. I don't have long suffering. I have a no suffering spirit influences check your influences second thing that i think the scripture lifts up for us today is that you need a grace field makeover everybody say grace field grace field makeover what does that mean that means beloved that if it's true that by grace you are saved through faith and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God so no one can boast. It means that the only way you are changed is because God unleashes grace in your life. And what is grace? Grace is when you get what you don't deserve. It is unconditional, without strings. When you get what you don't deserve. Mercy is the opposite. Mercy is when you don't get what you do deserve. And you know, when I, I, I probably said this too many times, but when, 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 I, when I first started to come to the neighborhood and I was working with some of the youngsters and their families, and I would always go into the court, not be standing up in front of the judge, because you know, the, the young people always tell me, Pastor, I didn't do it. But I go, this old racist system. Arresting these young boys, and they didn't do it. I go up in there, you know, I was skinny, 29 years old, and everybody was innocent. Somebody say amen. I go up in there, oh, you, you, I, you know, just all my righteous, holy indignation. I mean, I can see, I like to cast the devil out that I can see. I don't worry about the devils I can't see. But the ones I can see, I, I have it for them. So I, and, then, and then they'll show me a videotape. Pastor, is that Demetrius? And I look at D, I'd be like, man. So after about the 10th, 20th, or 30th time, I stopped asking for what they do deserve. I just say, don't give them justice. Just give us mercy. Don't give them what they do deserve. How many are glad that God don't give you what you do deserve? Amen. Some of us, we in here, oh, these kids, these kids, these kids. <laughs> no, good and well. When you was them kids, you, 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 you barely slipped, slid through. You just slid. That's how you got by. 
How many of y'all got by this many times like that? Like just barely, barely, you just barely, barely got by. I used to tell the kids, you don't make criminals like they used to. Amen. Because you know, some of y'all, you pants sagging, you trying to run from the cops and all you can, you can do, that's all you can do. Back in the day, you, you not going to catch me today. They, But you know you was one of them. And it was the mercy and grace of God. Amen. That keeps keeping you. Huh? How many know you being kept by the mercy and the grace of God? And God's grace. God's grace is making you over. Turning you into a, another version of you. God's grace is unlocking parts of your life and your heart that you didn't know was even in there because it's been buried under so much sin and so much trouble and so much abuse and so much hurt. And God is saying grace is unlocking the person that I, God is saying, the person I imagined you to be in eternity. Woo. Before sin got involved. It's not because of your own works. You, you, your works ain't good enough. Your works ain't good enough to deserve the grace of God. So here, 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 here's the question. Are there parts of your life in need of a faith? Grace transformation. How can faith, that faith which unlocks grace, transform you to believe it before you see it? To turn doubt to belief, pessimism to hope, death to life. Where are you in need of more grace? Grace filled makeovers. They turn you into a whole nother person. The more you follow Jesus, you ought to become a different person. You ought not follow Jesus and you're the same person you was yesterday. That means grace is not having its full impact. You ought to change. There ought to be a demonstrable change. Every day I've looked in the mirror my whole life, I feel like I'm the same. And I remember, you know, I like to travel. It's like my, one of my little, you know, ways to try to enjoy life while I'm out here tearing up stuff. In Jesus' name for justice, somebody say amen. I remember I was in, in Rome. We, we had a meeting at the Vatican. Uh, we were meeting with the, the Pope's people. This was 2016 trying to get them to, 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 to put ending slavery, which would include mass incarceration and criminalization as a part of Pope Francis' justice agenda. And thankfully, we got a chance to meet with these people and they agreed and that was part of their agenda. It was really cool. So, you know, it was like a, a nice little thing we did. So I, I, I want to stay later because, you know, I want to go visit places. So I remember this is one of the first times I realized that I was way heavier than I thought I was and way older than I believed I was. Because, you know, many of you may find this hard to believe, but I was very athletic. I played basketball, I had a little baby hook like magic. You know, it was, it was you know, no look passes. You know, I was, I was kind of, you know, I, was, <laughs> I, could, I could do some stuff on the court, praise God. And you know, <laughs> life happens and, you know, it just, it, 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 it left. But, but I was trying to, you know, I, I was trying to take a picture in front of the Coliseum. I got up early in the morning, like four or five in the morning, so the sun was coming up, no cars out there, and that's what one of the guys told me to do. So I, I set up my, 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 my little camera on, you know, the automatic shot, and, and, and I had to jump on a, up on a, on a boulder that was probably about this high. Now, in my mind, I still believed I had hops and agility. And so I... Set the thing, you know, 10 seconds, it's click, clicking down, and so 10, nine, so I'm counting in my head, and I made a leap, and I, I, I didn't make it. I landed on my knee, and I was in such pain. And the first thing that went through my mind is, I'm glad that no one's out here to see this. Because <laughs> young Mike, he don't got it no more. 
for almost 40 years, I've been looking at myself one way. But I was not fully cognizant of the changes that had happened in my life. And it wasn't necessarily, you know, demonstrable change, but it was enough for me to, to I never tried that again. How many of you know, you may not always track your change on a day-to-day -day basis, but over time, there ought to be some change that you and others are able to track. Not because of your works or goodness, but because God's grace is working on you. There must and ought to be a change. And the final thing I'll say, we're pieces of work in the eyes of God, in the purposes of God, is because God wants to work on you so you can in turn put in good work in the world. God wants to work on you. Tease out some of those things that you know need teasing out. Why? Because when you don't work out those things, those things are worked out in the world. People wonder why is there so much meanness, violence. It's because folk are not allowing grace to work that out of them. There's so much fear in the world. Why? Because folks aren't allowing God to work that fear out in them. And when you don't work that fear out, it shows up. It shows up in your relationships. It shows up in your profession. It shows up in how you vote. It shows up in the causes you champion. So God wants to help work out those things in your life. So you can put in good work. What is good work? healing, restoration, justice, peace, joy, the fruits of the spirit we just mentioned. That's good work. Imagine if every follower of Jesus only showed up in the world with the fruit of the spirit. You could not, as the New York Times article captured, show up in a barn, obsessed with fear, anger, and violence if the spirit was working that out of you. Now, beloved, it, it, I, I'm a real person, because, you know, I, I, after certain people die who are the saints, you know, there's been few folks in my life in the past couple years that have died, and I, 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 I revere them to be saints, people who, who, who exhibit the transcendent, beatific vision of Christ. And so, you know, after some folk die that I think should stay here, I'd be like, God, why, why, you, why you take them? I can think of 10 people right now who, who, who I think they oxygen just be just turned off. Just. <laughs> then, you know, the spirit, it convicts me. Be like, McBride, what if you was on somebody's list? And I'd be like, okay, thank you, God, that you don't listen to these kind of prayers. <laughs> Ain't that somehow you think you're the only one praying for somebody's oxygen to be turned off? It don't ever dawn on you that somebody's praying for yours. And then you glad, God, I'm glad you don't answer every one of my prayers. Hello, somebody. So that stuff is in some of us. And God has to work it out. I mean, as long as someone is breathing, God can always change them. This is better news for you personally, as long as you're breathing. As long as you are alive, God can always change you. You're a piece of work. Let me say it differently. You're a piece of God's work. God's working on you. And so whenever somebody get on your nerves this week, you ought to look at them and tell them, you ain't nothing but a piece of God's work. 
God's working on you, and I'm going to keep speaking life into you. I'm going to keep speaking beauty into you. I'm going to keep speaking purpose into you. Even when you are upsetting me and harming me, God, help me to be reminded that we are all your handiwork. Amen. Just like God is working on me, how many know God's working on you? You ought to tell your neighbor, God's working on you. You're not the final version of God's masterpiece. God is working on you. Come on, stand to your feet, everybody. Let's take a few moments. And let's ask God, Lord, work on me. We used to sing a song. Work on me, Jesus. Work me over. Please work me over. Woo. Then it said, because I know when you get through, I won't be the same. Lord, them old school songs, they had some, they had some, they had some bars and some game. These new songs we sing in, it's just, yeah, I don't know what we're talking about half the time, praise God. But how many know I need God to work on me? Lift your hands and say, God, work on me, Lord. Come on, say it again. God, work on me, Lord. Make me over. Make me brand new. Make me into the masterpiece that you've created me to be. I know, God, that part of how you make me over is to help me get my mind right. So therapy and, 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 and counseling and healing work is how you work on me, God. So let me say yes. Yes to the work I must do. I know, God, that I got to check my influences. I refuse to be overtaken by Christian nationalism and authoritarianism, by violence, oh God, Christo-fascism, all these false gospels run amok in our culture. I refuse to be, Lord, swept up in the anything goes culture where, where there are no standards and there are, God, no guidelines and there are no guardrails. God, I need my influences to be checked by your spirit. God, because I, I want to be like you, God. I, I want you, God, to unleash your grace-filled makeover. Hallelujah. God, I want to be turned into something Beautiful by your standards. I, I want to be fearfully and wonderfully made. I want to be able to look at my neighbor, my brother, look at the young men and women in the neighborhood, look at the undocumented loved ones, look at the those who are unhoused. And I want to see God, the grace and the mercy that is at work in me, at work in them. God, I don't want to become self-righteous and, and punitive, God. Because you're not self-righteous and punitive with me. So God, help me to put in good work, the work of justice, the work of righteousness, the work of healing, the work of self-discipline, the work of transformation, the work of salvation. Help me to put in good work, God. May I be filled with the power of your spirit so God, I can be made over and over again. And so, God, I do it right now. Somebody say, do it, Lord. Come on, say it again. Somebody say, do it, Lord. Say it again. Do it, Lord. Make me over, God. Make me holy. Make me righteous. Lord, take my pain. Take my, 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 my worries. Take my anxieties. Take my disappointments. And make me over again. In the name of Jesus. Oh, so God, bless the person next to me. Bless the person behind me. Bless the person in front of me. Bless the persons at my home. Bless my children. Bless my partner. Bless my marriage. Bless my family. Bless my community. Bless us all, God. Because we need you. We need you, Lord. Somebody say, I need you, God. Come on, say it again. I need you, God. Say it again. I need you, God. Lord, to make us who you would have us to be. And we'll say thank you, Lord, for all the ways that you work, all the ways that you move. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Come on, clap your hands, everybody. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on, give somebody a high five and tell them you're a piece of God's work. Tell them that you're a piece of God's work. You're a piece of God's work. You are a piece of God's work. And the great thing about being a piece
piece of God's work is when you put it all together. We are God's masterpiece. Oh, somebody holler, I am a piece of God's work. And then say, we are God's masterpiece. Clap your hands, everybody, if you're a masterpiece.